theyeshiva.net. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our new series here on the basics of Emuna, the fundamentals of Jewish faith. We opened the opportunity for people to ask questions. So I received over the last uh, few days numerous questions. I'm going to begin this first lecture by reading to you four questions that I received. I chose these four because they more or less deal with a common theme, and it's the theme we're going to address this evening, Be'ezer Hashem. Okay, question one from a young man living in Williamsburg. By the way, everybody could send in their questions to emuna at theyeshiva.net. That's emuna at theyeshiva.net. You don't have to sign your name if you don't want. So it could remain anonymous and you could sign your name if you want. And if you wish, we shall not share your name. You can ask any questions. And bli neder be'ezer Hashem, we will try to address them at least as many as possible. Here's question number one. Does faith in Judaism begin with a logical basis and then it follows with emuna and trust? Or no, it's flat out emuna, flat out faith. If it does start with logic, where is the line? If it's flat out emuna without a logical basis, how are we supposed to acquire it if we don't have it? What if I don't have this faith? How am I supposed to get it? How does my father expect me to follow him blindly if I'm just not feeling like he? And how do I know I'm not like a Muslim? They also scream faith, faith, faith. On the other hand, if it does start with logic, how can it be required from layman people? Great question. Question number two. This is from a young man living in Muncie. I am a curious person. I'm very inquisitive. I always ask questions. I always had since I was a child. When I became a teenager, I started to ask my father questions about how we know certain things in Judaism are true. First, he tried answering me. But then, it seems like he didn't have an answer. How do I know? At some point, when I started to ask my questions, he said to me, this is apicursus, this is kfira, this is heresy. I told him, tate, tati, maybe it's just you have nothing to answer, so you call it heresy. He says, no, 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 it's just that these questions a Jew doesn't ask. I told him, so how do you know it's true if you don't have answers to these questions? He said, I don't have to ask questions to know that it's true. So I said to him, father, but what's the proof? And my father said, I saw miracles by my Rebbe. I tell my father, but I did not see any miracles. He says, I did. I asked my father, when did the miracle stop? Isn't it funny that all of you have all these stories, but the day I was born, all the miracles stopped by all the Rebbes. I must be so evil that when I came into the world, suddenly all the stories stopped. Isn't that fascinating? Who is right, me or my father? Okay. Third question from a young woman living in the West. Why do Jewish people follow all the rules without understanding or even liking them? I think it's very important to live a life that you want and enjoy. If I can't do it with all the rules, what should I do? And why do they all believe all these rules? Anything you believe you can't prove, otherwise it wouldn't be a belief. So by definition, belief means that you can't prove it. So if you can't prove it, why do you believe it? Okay, good question. <laughs> Last question from a middle-aged man who also grew up in Brooklyn. 
and he says, I find something very paradoxical in the community I grew up in and in the home I grew up in. Whenever I ask a question, what is Judaism? Who is Hashem? Who is God? What is Torah all about? Why do we do all the mitzvahs? They always tell me, no questions. We don't have to know all the answers. We just have to do what God wants. But suddenly, whenever tragedy strikes, they always have answers. Whenever there's pain, they always know why. Isn't it interesting? When it comes to knowing the basics of Judaism, they never know why. When it comes to understand why this one got sick and this one died, they always know why. How did that happen? Could you please explain this? Okay, these are four questions that came in through the email from real people. I read them almost verbatim, just with a few grammatical, uh, <laughs> grammatical questions, because some of them have a better English than others. By the way, you could write to me in Yiddish. Yiddish. You can't have a schreiben in or the glance of in Yiddish or the andere Sprache. But these were written in English. Okay, these are, are big questions and they, I think, bring us right into a fundamental theme that is appropriate to address here in this first and opening lecture on the basics of Amunah. There is, I think, a fundamental mistake that many people, many Jews, have when it comes to the word Amunah and the concept of Amunah. This is not about judging the mistake. We make mistakes. Sometimes the mistake comes because of one factor or another factor, but it's still a mistake. And the mistake is sometimes even in the very translation of the word Amunah, which is faith. Many people translate Amunah as being essentially blind, meaning, I don't know if it's really true. How could I? That's why I have to believe. Belief, by definition, means I believe. I don't know. If I would know, I wouldn't have to believe, as this woman wrote. So by definition, the word faith, emuna, means I don't know. It may be true. It may not be true. I just believe it. So now you'll ask the qu person the question, so why do you believe it? And they'll tell you, because it's a mitzvah to believe it. So I'll say, okay, but how do you know that this mitzvah to believe it is true? We don't ask questions. We just believe. But what if you're believing something false? You can't prove it. We, we don't speak like that. We just believe. In other words, what the person is really saying is, I may not know that it's true, actually. In fact, it may be false. But I say that I believe, or I was told that I have to believe. So I put myself in a state of mind where I say, I believe. But here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. If you would have grown up in a Muslim home, or in a Christian home, an Episcopalian home, a Mormon home, a Baptist home, a Catholic home, or if you want a Protestant home, if you would have grown up in another community, in another environment, in another culture, among another nation, among another tribe, and they would have taught you things that are true, and when you would say, how do you know, they would say, we believe, you have to believe. Is there really a difference? Or that is what faith means. Faith means what we call blind faith. People say, you take a leap of faith. What does a leap of faith mean? A leap means you have to take a quantum leap, a jump, because at some point you say, I don't know if it's true, but I just believe it. If this is the case, and this is what our Amunah is, it's pretty sad. It's pretty pathetic. But the truth is, this has nothing to do with Amunah in Judaism. This is called stupidity or intellectual laziness. It has nothing to do with Amunah. To put it bluntly, with all due respect, Amunah does not mean there's a mitzvah to be an idiot. Amunah does not mean that I think it may be a lie, but I just say I believe. That has nothing to do with truth. It has nothing to do with authenticity. It has nothing to do with Amunah. As somebody who challenged me about this series and said that this series undermines Judaism. I said, why? So we have lectures on Amunah. What's there to lecture? 
Emuna means you believe, you believe. What's there to lecture? So I asked him this question that I'm presenting to you. I said, if you would have grown up in Syria, not in Brooklyn, not in Miami, not in B'nai Brak, not in Jerusalem, if you would have grown up there, you would have been taught different things in your schools, different texts. You would have been taught all about Muhammad, and he is the prophet, and all of his laws, and all of the prophecies that God gave him. And when you would start asking questions, they would tell you, we believe. Don't you realize that you're basically putting Judaism exactly in the same category? Is this where your amuna begins and where your amuna ends? Essentially, you're telling me that you have no basis for your belief. It's just you ended up in this household. So for this, thousands of years, Jews sacrificed their lives, fought for their Judaism through thick and thin, endured savage suffering in order to cling to Judaism, and it was all based on indoctrination or dogma that they heard from their great-grandmother when they served the chicken soup, and that's the entire basis for it. The truth is that this definition of Muna, a definition of amuna in this fashion, not thinking, being blind, being irrational, has nothing to do with amuna. As I said, this has to do with laziness or stupidity. Depends on who you are. So now you'll ask me a question. What is amuna? That's a great question. So I want to begin to explain this. I'm going to try to give a uh, comprehensive overview, at least of one aspect of this discussion. Generally, if you study Jewish history, and you study Jewish works throughout Jewish history, you will see, generally, that there are two streams of consciousness, two shittas, two mahalchen, two gangen, two perspectives, two hashkafas, that G'dayli Yisrael, great sages and leaders, developed in their works over the centuries. The best way to define it is the way we open up every one of our davenings, every one of our prayers. Baruch Atah Hashem, Eloikeinu, Ve'eloikei Aveseinu. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, and the God of our fathers. The obvious question is, isn't the God of our fathers and our God the same God? Did God suddenly change between my father and me? What's Eloikeinu Ve'eloikei Aveseinu? And then again we say, Eloikei Avraham, Eloikei Yitzchak, Eloikei Yaakov. The God of Avram, the God of Yitzhak, didn't they have the same God? By definition, the God they believed in was not, changeable, not changing from Avram to Yitzhak, from Yitzhak to Yaakov. Or as the Pasuk says in Malachi, Ani Hashem, Loisha Nisi. So why are we distinguishing between our father's God, or our mother's God, and our God, or between Avram's Hashem, and Yitzhak's Rebbe Nishalaylam, and Yaakov's Rebbe Nishalaylam? So there's a famous explanation of the Baal Shem Tev about this. It's brought in Svarim. I also saw it once in Shal Satruvis, Panem Iris, I think. Rav Eisenstadt says it over there. He was a contemporary of the Baal Shem Tev. Basically, there are two different experiences, or two different ways in which a person can come to terms with the concept of Hashem, or generally Yiddishkeit, all of Torah, and all of godliness and divinity. One is, I say it's Aleikei Nu, or Aleikai, it's my God, it's our God, and one is Elikei Aveseinu, it's my father's God. What's the difference? In the language of the Rishonim, one is Derech HaChira, and one is Derech HaMesayra. One is through research, investigation, and one is through tradition. And throughout the generations, different Jews harbored or embraced different approaches and felt that one approach was superior or more beneficial or more true, or better, or more practical than the other approach. One approach said, you have to investigate. You should investigate. Search. Use your mind and ask questions. Use your mind. It's a tool that God gave you. Figure it out. Figure it out. Make him your God. The other approach said, no. No. Follow tradition. You have a father, you have a mother. They had fathers and mothers all the way back. You don't have to go back so long. It's 3,300 years. But in terms of generations, how many generations is it? Uh, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 people. If you go back, they stood at Har Sinai. 
They stood at Mount Sinai. God revealed himself to the entire nation. They all accepted Torah and mitzvahs. Altogether, it's around three million Jews. They communicated this tradition. And therefore, for them, this was not blind. This was not ludicrous. This was not invented. They saw it. They experienced it. They gave their lives to it. And they passed it on generation to generation to generation. Embraced that and embraced the Torah as truth based on Messiah. This is the God of my father, my grandfather, my great-great-grandmother, all the way back to Maimed Harsinah, to the experience of Sinah. Which is better? Each one has an advantage, they explained. The advantage of the first, we understand. It's mine. I own it. I developed it. I acquired it. It's something that I internalized. It's much more pnimiistic. It's much more uh, internalized. It's, uh, it became mine. I'm not just relying on generations of forefathers of my ancestors. On the other hand, the other one said, no, if you're using your logic, you know, a mind is a mind. It can take you in many different directions. You can make errors. You can stumble. You can reach wrong conclusions. Philosophy is very, very complex. Theology is very, very complex. It's winding. You can get lost. Furthermore, they said, with your mind, even if you reach accurate conclusions, but nonetheless, truth is always beyond what my mind can comprehend. And therefore, the truth that are articulated in the Torah that was authenticated at Maimed Har Sinai, this will allow me access to truth that I will never be able to achieve with my own mind. Let me give an example of two classic works. Both have and st had and still have a tremendous impact on Jewish life. And they really harbor opposite views. One is the view of the Sefer HaChinuch, and one is the view of the Chayvah Salavavos. Sefer HaChinuch was written in the 13th century, in the 1200s. The man who wrote it did not write his name. He wrote that he lives in Barcelona in Spain. It's assumed that it's Reb Aaron Halevi from Barcelona, although he doesn't write his name. And it's called Sefer HaChinuch. It was the major comprehensive encyclopedia of all 630 mitzvahs of the Torah, a description of the mitzvah, the reason for it, a brief description of its laws, of its conditions, and of its message. This was a unique contribution to the Book of Education. Sefer HaChinuch, in 1200s, one of the Rishonim. 1200s, he writes the Sefer, and he gives, he presents a beautiful Hakdama. Introduction to Sefer HaChinuch is something worth reading and studying. And in this introduction, he says that for Jews, Yiddishkeit is not blind at all. If it would have been based on the famous argument of the Sefer HaChinuch, of the Rambam, of the Kuzari, that if Yiddishkeit was based on miracles, if it was based on uh, Moshe being a charismatic figure, we'll never know if it's true. And that's why all other religions are based on the fact that one person or a few people claim that they heard God speak, and then everybody chooses to believe them. He says, Yiddishkeit could have ended up like that. Like any other religion, Moshe Rabbeinu says, God spoke to me. The only way to make it real had to be through mass revelation. And you have no other religion that could claim that millions of people experienced it, and part of the experience was a commandment to pass it on to their children and to live their whole life by it. 630 mitzvahs. And he says, therefore, Jews did not doubt it. Now he says, we didn't live that. We didn't live through that experience. We have parents and great-parents and great-great-grandparents. But the Sefer HaChinuch says, I have a question, and I use his metaphor. He says, if there's a spring of water, and it's a wonderful spring, a flowing spring of water, and you're thirsty, and you want to go drink it, and there are 600,000 people who stand there and tell you, don't drink it. We have drunk, we, have, we, have, we consume this water, we'll tell you the consequences. Don't drink it, it will have dire consequences. It looks fresh, but it's poisonous. And there's one doctor, and the doctor says, from my understanding, and from my expertise in water, this is perfectly fine to drink. The Sefer HaChinuch says, who are you going to accept? Rationally, who are you going to accept? Are you going to accept 600,000 people who said they experimented with the water? Or are you going to expect this one man who may be brilliant and logical? He says, you know what the rational idea here is? He says, the world is complicated. He says, who understands the world? He says, e, we don't even understand one blade of grass. Till today, they don't even understand the depth of one blade of grass. What's in one blade of grass? He says, the wisdom in trees, in plants, in bushes, in insects, 
the depth of organisms. This he's writing in the 1200s. He says we can't even figure out the, 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 the secrets and herbs and so many different herbs. And these are just herbs. So we see that the mind is so limited on understanding the secrets of the universe. He says, but what the Torah articulates gives you access to truth that the mind will never be able to fully comprehend and access. And the Torah was authenticated because of Maimed Har Sinai. Therefore, it's much superior and beneficial for Jews to follow the Messiah, to follow the tradition. Comes the Chayvas Halavavas, who lived 200 years before Sefer Achinach. Rabbeinu Bechai Ibn Pekuda wrote one of the most fundamental works of Jewish ethics and Jewish philosophy, Duties of the Heart. And the Rabbeinu Bechai Ibn Pekuda argues and he says, it's a mitzvah to investigate. It's a mitzvah to inquire. The Torah says you have to know. David tells Shalom, Not believe. Know the God of your father and then you could serve him. Know Hashem and then you could get inspired by him. And he brings Psukim Amar Chazal. He says it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to put on tefillin. It's a mitzvah to keep Shabbos. It's a mitzvah to use your mind and figure out how the world proves God's existence. Figure out the truths of Yiddishkeit. He says, this is a mitzvah. If you can't, you can't. But he says, this is the way to do it. This is what the Chayvah Salavavis argues. The Shalah, Rabbeinu Yeshaya Horowitz in the Sefer Shnei Luchas Habris, beautifully explains the Pasuk in the Shira. We say it every morning in Parshas B'Shalach. Zekeli v'anveyu, elekeyavi v'aremimenu. This is my God and I will beautify him. The God of my father and I will exalt him. So the Shalah says, it's talking about two different experiences of Yiddishkeit. One is Zekeli. This is my God. How can you call it my God? It's a God. The awareness in which I developed through my own work, through my own toil, intellectually and emotionally. Then there's Elikei I'm convinced that this God exists. But why? Because my father my grandfather, my great-grandfather, all the way back to the generation that experienced Mount Sinai. Says the Shalom, what's the difference? He says, Zekeli, if it's my God, ve'anvehu. Anvehu, he says, is a combination of two words. Anivuhu. Anivuhu dvukim beyachat. Anvehu, anivuhu, me and him are one. Because I own him, so to speak. He's mine, I got him. Elikei avi, if it's the God of my father, v'arayim emenu. He remains miroimam. He remains aloof, sublime, exalted, above me. It's not v'anvehu, anivuhu, dvukim biyachat. Two streams, two, two, two shittas, two perspectives. Comes the Rambam. The Rambam lived after Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar could have lived in the 10 hundreds. He was born around 1050. The Rambam lived in the 11 hundreds. A century after Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, a century before the Sefer Achinuch. The Rambam passed away 1205. The Rambam says... He opens up his magnum opus, Mishnah Torah, Yad HaChazaka. What are the opening words of the Rambam? Anybody remembers? Yisoid HaYisoidos V'amud HaChachmas The foundation of all foundations and the pillar of all wisdom is Leida Sheyesha Matsu Rishon V'hu Mamtsi Kol Nimtza V'chol HaNimtzoi Mishamayim V'aretz Umashe B'neim Loi Nimtzu Elo Ma'amitas Yimotzoi V'im Yala Al Adas Sh'wein Loi Motzoi E'in Dover Ha'achir Yachel Leimotzoi The first two halachas of Rambam To know that there is a primary first existence who brings all of existence into being and everything in existence from heaven to earth and in between only emerged from the truth of his existence the Rambam doesn't say any other word but Leida. And he finishes off Allah Vav, Vidiyas Dover Zem Mitzvah Sase Shenemar Anoichi Hashem Alekecha. Knowing this is a mitzvah because the Pasuk says Anoichi Hashem Alekecha, which according to him means Yidiya. And actually the source of this is a Zoyar, Raya Mehemne and Parshas Nasi, that it's a mitzvah. The Rambam has another Sefer, also an encyclopedia of the mitzvah, it's called Sefer Mitzvahs. That was written in Arabic. And most translations, the first mitzvah is. The mitzvah says, say, Lahamin, to believe Sheyashamalika, to believe there is a God. But in his Mishnah Torah, Yad Chazaka, he says, Leida. And I believe in a recent translation by Rav Kapach of Yemen, who was a big expert in Arabic, 
and retranslated the Rambam's works from the old middle, mi, m, the old translations by the Ibn Tabun family, I believe he also says in Sefer HaMitzvahs, it's about knowledge, not faith. In other words, the Rambam believes you have to know. Knowledge can only happen if you investigate. I'm giving you an example of a few people, but if you'll go through the generations, you'll see there were thinkers on each side. You'll have Rabbeinu Sa'ad Yagon from the 900s. You'll have the Chayva Salavavis. You'll have the Rambam. You'll have the Eben Ezra. You'll have Ral Bag. You have Reb Yosef Olbo, the author of Ikrim. You have the Abar Benel, Don Yitzhak Abar Benel. You'll have Reb Chizdoi Kraskas. They emphasize the mitzvah to know. Chakira. And then you'll have the Sefer Achinuch. You'll have Reb Yehuda Halevi in the Kuzari. Reb Yehuda Halevi from Spain. Also the 1100s. And he'll say what you receive through the Messiah is far superior. Far more beneficial. And this will continue. We'll have a famous Charles Shachuvis of Harivosh, Reb Yitzchok Bar Shesha, Simen Memhei, who attacks the path of, relatively, who attacks that other path and feels again the tradition, the tradition is great. It is always much better. Messiah is much better. Elekeave say nu. I'm not going to get into it at the moment, but there is a Chidush uh, Harim who says something, and a generation later, Reb Chaim Shmulevich, the mirror Rosh Hashiva said a similar Torah that this was a debate. Who were the first ones to have this debate? They claimed this was a debate between Yisroi and Moshe Rabbeinu. The Mechilta says in Parsha Shmois that Yisroi made an oath with his son-in-law. What was the oath? Ben Hanoilad Rishain. The child who's born first, you give up for Avoid the Zara. And Moshe agrees. And that's why Moshe had a problem with this boy. His name was Gershom, not Eliezer. Gershom. This boy had to give up for idolatry. And everybody asks, Moshe agreed for a Shidduch? Imagine somebody makes a Shidduch with your son. And says, one minute, one condition. You have to eat pork every night for dinner. You say, no, for a shidduch? You give up on Avodah Zorah? Who, Moshe? And who, Yisrael, who gave up the Avodah Zorah? Go find another shidduch. Go find another one. It's very difficult to understand. So the Chidush Harim brilliantly says, we don't know where to put the kama. <laughs> Everybody reads the Mechilta wrong. We read the Mechilta, Ben Hanoi Lutchila al Zorah. The boy who's born first goes to Avodah Zorah. He says, wrong reading. Ben Hanoi Led. The boy who was born, Kama, Tchila Avodah Zorah. First, I'm going to teach him what's out there on the other side. So then he'll be able to appreciate Yiddishkeit. He shouldn't be able to say his whole life, the grass is greener on the other side. You want to see the other side? I'll show you the other side. He says, like me. Nobody appreciates Judaism like me. You know why? Nobody could say I was brainwashed. Nobody could say I was given the Kool-Aid. Nobody could say I grew up in a Froom household. I didn't grow up in anything. What does Rashi say? Only Yisra could say God is greater than every other God. Because Yisra spent years in India, in Tibet, in New Zealand. In South America, in the East, in the West, he searched everything. He knew everything. He says, Ati Yadati. Moshe said, I don't want this, I don't need this. Again, a very fascinating argument, but Moshe consents with the first, with the first boy. It's not exactly the same argument, it's much more subtle, it's on a different angle. I'm just, on a general level, it could be connected. So we have our two streams. I want to read to you a teaching of the Baal Shem Tev, which sums it up. It's in Baal Shem Tev, Allah Torah, page Kufay and Vav. I'm going to put it in the source sheets that will be posted together with the video on the yeshiva.net. Together with the video on the yeshiva.net, you will have the source sheet where you're going to have the quotes of all these sources that I mentioned and other sources. I'm going to read it inside. Zakh the Baal Shem Tev. Tam loma onu oimrim alakeinu velakeaviseinu. Why do we say in davening always, Baruch Hashem, 
Eloikeinu velikei aviseinu. Our God and the God of our fathers. There are two types of people who believe in Hashem. Aleph, the first category is Shamamin ba Kadesh Baruch Hu Machmas Shehoylech Bedarkei Avoyis of Hakadmoinim Ve'im Kol Zeh Munasei Chazaka. The first is somebody who believes in Hashem because he follows in the pathway of his fathers and his mothers all the way back to the first generation of the Jewish people who stood at Mount Sinai, and together with this, his emuna, his faith is strong and it's powerful because he truly appreciates the fact that they did not sell him the Brooklyn Bridge, they communicated to him the truth. Vahabe's the second category is Misha Baal Hamana Sadas Machmas Achkira, somebody who reaches an acceptance of the Jewish religion based on his own research and investigation. Vahiluk Beinayim, who says the Baal Shem, the difference between them is Hasug Ha'alif Yeshloi Maila Sheyev Shalafatis, so you say, Afim Yemir Loch Kam Achkira, so you say, so you say, so you The first category, even if you will ask him different questions, you won't derail him from his amuna. Why? Because he truly accepts the truth because of the tradition. And for him, the tradition equals authenticity. And therefore, even though there are things that you can question and ask different problems, it will still not take away his amuna, even though there's a question. Plus, he doesn't even go into investigations. So he may not even have any questions. But there's a problem. This type of faith is routine, it's habit. It doesn't have the depth that comes with intellect, with reasoning. He doesn't own it. Aval Habe is the second type. Yeshloi Meiler has a great advantage. Shemachmas shehikir aboyri is barach machmas goydel chikirasi who chazak be'amuna shleima ba'avagmura. The second person who recognizes Hashem because of the depth of his investigation, his faith is powerful, and there is complete love, there is complete dedication, there is real appreciation. I love it. I really get it. Aval gamkin yeshloi chisarin. There is a disadvantage. Shabakali b'chaylam lefatayisai because you can also dissuade him. Vim yavil lo rayas asayis to his chakirayis. If he's pata chas v'shalom, if you bring him strong proofs that demonstrate to him that his thinking was flawed and his rationale was mistaken, he loses his amuna. Aval mish shnei hamidos biyado elam ayleim enu. Somebody who has both. There is nothing greater than this. The hainu shesay mechalavayis of hakadmayin and bechayzek. He relies on the tradition of his fathers with firmness. Plus, he uses his own resources and his own heart and his own mind to investigate. This is wholesome and good. That's why in our tefillahs, in our prayers, in our blessings, we say, Our God and the God of our fathers. What's the difference? Eloikeinu means our God, the God that is ours, the God that is mine, the God that I, so to speak, discovered through my own process, through my own journey, through my own mind, through my own experience, through my own heart. And then there's Eloikei Aveseinu, the God that my father, my grandfather, my great-grandmother, all the way back to Sinai and before, discovered and they passed it on generation to generation. Eloikeinu veleikei Aveseinu. So here we have the two streams in Jewish history. Some said, you could rely on Eliekei Aveseinu. Some said, no, you need to have Eliekeinu also. Even those who said you could rely on Eliekei Aveseinu, of course understood the advantage in having Eliekeinu. The argument is, is it a mitzvah via data that you have to go search Das Eliekei or not? But, as the Baal Shem Tev teaches us, it's always great to have Eliekeinu Sometimes people don't have the mental space. Sometimes people don't have the intellectual capacity. Sometimes people don't feel they need it. Sometimes people are not in that zone. But there is a unique advantage both in Elekeinu and Elekeinu. But let's remember one common denominator. And that is, don't confuse either path with senseless faith. With blind faith. With faith that is based on me shutting my eyes and saying, I don't see the truth, but I believe anyway. If somebody comes and tells me, if my father comes to me and tells me, you have to believe that the earth is flat. And my mother comes and tells me, I have to believe that the moon rises during the day and sets in the evening, and then the sun rises in the evening and sets in the morning. 
You have to believe it. And I say, okay, I believe it. I believe it. That's not emunah. That's foolishness. That's senselessness. Prove it to me. Explain it to me. Why? When we speak about the emunah, Based on tradition, based on Matatoida, based on Maimon Darsina, it's not about senselessness. It's about appreciating that there is empirical evidence. There is a truth to Maimon Darsina, even though I haven't seen it with my own eyes or I don't remember it. Now you'll ask me, prove it? How can you reach that? You're believing your father and all religions believe their fathers and their mothers that they saw? That's a great question. That's what the Chinuch said and the Rambam says. It's about mass revelation and we're going to be exploring this particular question with God's grace in class number 6, class number 7, class number 8. We're going to be exploring it. Class number 11, we're going to get there. This is a very heavy subject. In other words, why is that logical? Why is believing tradition logical? Isn't tradition another form of blind faith? It's because I like my grandmother's knedlach, I like her chicken soup, I like her kreplach. What's the proof? Maybe they just fabricated it. They said, we stood at Sinai, we saw God. Every religion says that somebody saw God, and you believe tradition. Why is tradition any more than blind faith? Great question, has to be discussed. But for them, those Jews who saw it, and those Jews who passed it on, and the children who accepted it, they accepted it as real truth. Why? We're going to discuss, but they accepted it as real truth. But that's not my own investigation. That's not my own research. There's Aleikeinu, and there is Aleikei Avoy Seinu. The Sefer Ikram Rabbi Yosef Albay says, in fact, the word emuna doesn't mean belief. It doesn't mean faith. It means certainty. Emuna means I trust. The word imun means trust, confidence, imun. Emuna, faithfulness. I trust it. I know something with certainty. How do you know something with certainty? To the best of your ability, you could know it in two different ways. Either because somebody told you it's snowing outside, and you know for sure that he's not lying. Maybe a thousand people came in and said it's snowing. You trust that they're not lying, so you know it's snowing outside, even though you're not outside, and there's no window for you to see. You know it's snowing outside, and sometimes you went outside yourself and you saw that it's snowing. In both of the cases, you're convinced for sure that it's snowing, but it's different paths. There is another element to Amuna that we're going to get to at the end of the class, and even more in the next week's class, in the next, uh, in the next series on Amuna, class number two. Another level of what Amuna means that doesn't have to do with these two paths. It's a different dimension of Amuna. We'll soon get to that. Again, at the end of this class and the next class. But here we're talking about the two streams of Alekenu, Velekeavisenu. But there's something else that we now have to understand. And it's a critical component as we introduce a series on the basics of Amuna. Let's go one step further. This entire argument has very re little relevance to the questions that I received in my email. And to questions that I and many others receive every day and questions that we all deal with personally or collectively, that we speak about or we don't speak about, and questions generally that come up today. And I'll tell you why. These two streams, these two shittas, these two views in Yiddishkeit, are all predicated on one premise. And that is, you don't have a question. You don't have a question. A Jewish boy, a Jewish girl goes up in a Jewish home, they believe their parents. They believe there's authenticity here. They believe this truth. One view says, your parents are great people. But you got to go figure it out on your own. Another view says, no. Follow the Messiah. That's a legitimate and deep argument in Jewish history. But what if somebody has questions? What if somebody comes and says, I don't know. This doesn't make sense to me. I have too many difficulties with this. I can't accept it. There's no view in Judaism that I know of, authentic view in Jewish tradition, that says that you have to look at this boy or girl and say, you're a shagetz. You're not allowed to ask questions. You're not allowed to ask questions. And the reason is very simple. If somebody comes to me and asks me a question, 
and my only response to him is what? We don't ask. By us, we don't ask questions. We believe. We have a tradition. We don't ask questions. I have a question. <laughs> Did we eliminate his question? You're 19 years old. You're 16 years old. You're 9 years old. You're 29 years old. You're 42 years old. And you come to your father, your mother, your rabbi, your rosh Hashiva, your mashgiach, your rabbi, your mechanech, your mashpia, your teacher, your mentor, and you say, I have this and this question. And all he can tell you is, by Yidin, Frekmanish, Kenishailis. Jews don't ask. It's disgusting to ask such a question. It's horrible to ask such a question. How dare you ask such a question? How did I end up with such a child? How did I end up with such a student? I have to go check my tefillin and my mezuzahs. And find out, maybe I'm not Jewish. How did I end up with such a person? How do you? We don't ask such questions. Great, beautiful. Messiah, it sounds great. I want to know one thing. Did you get rid of the question? Does this boy say, ah, Tati, now I get it. It's wonderful, I have no questions anymore, and now the faith starts burning in his soul. Did you ever see one experience like that? Did you ever see that happen even once? The boy who comes to me and says, as it happened, if I would have grown up in a different community, in a secular home, or in another religion, and they would have told me all the stories that they have, and they would have told me God wants that you have to do, you have to do this on Friday, and God wants this, and if not, they also have a Gehenim. I'm also going to burn. And when I say, can you prove that anybody ever come back? And they'll say, for that, you're going to burn even more. And I say, did anybody tell you about that fire? Oh, you don't know what type of Gehenna you're going to have. And the boy comes to me and he says, now I'm an adult and the fear doesn't speak to me anymore. And telling me that I'm going to end up in pots with hot water. And I'm going to have to put my child into a pot of hot water as they teach in some places. Rahman al Doesn't speak to me anymore. It's all brainwashing. And all I could tell this child is, we don't ask questions by us. This is what enlightened people do. This is what maskilim do. This is what Gentiles do. This is what Goyim do. This is not what Jews do. Does he go away feeling, ah, now I'm satisfied. Now I can embrace Judaism with enthusiasm? Or maybe, maybe, my dear friends, it's actually the other way around. And I'm going to quote what a boy once told me, a yeshiva bacha once told me. He says, when I came to my father the first time with my questions, 50% I thought he doesn't have an answer. 50% I thought he has an answer. I wasn't sure. When he told me, we don't ask such questions, never ask such questions, now I became convinced 100% that he doesn't have an answer. Not only did I not eliminate the question, I confirmed it. I enforced it. You're trying to strengthen his amuna. All you did was show him that this faith is futile. It's irrational. Let's understand especially how relevant it's in this generation. We live in a generation and people can argue theories from today till tomorrow. But if you speak to people, we live in a generation that if a young man or a young woman comes with real questions and all I can tell them is we don't speak like this, we don't ask, get out of my office, get out of my room or stop it or just get it out of your mind, all I could say is we don't ask questions, Messiah, 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 Ruach Yisrael, Sove, Emunah, Emunah, Sikhvan, Git, for the Tata, for the Zayda, for the Elta Zayda, they were smarter than you, everybody was smarter than you. Who do you think you are? A little boy, you're a little chick who didn't open your eyes yet. You say, Father, I may be a chick, but I have a question. Sometimes chicks have questions. Sometimes you ask questions with closed eyes. In our generation, you tell me, what does that demonstrate to him? That Judaism is a real religion or not a real religion? Does it tell him that Yiddishkeit has a strong basis, or it says that the whole Yiddishkeit, hinktafein fissels, it's, it's, it's a limping Judaism. Remember, 
We cannot choose today to answer or not to answer. You know why? If you don't answer, you're also giving an answer. I never saw somebody not answer and not give an answer. By not answering, you're giving a very powerful answer. And the answer that you're giving from the perspective of the questionnaire is, ganz Yiddishkeit steht auf hinnerische You know what that means? You want to translate? All of Judaism stands on uh, chicken legs. In other words, I don't have what to say. I don't have what to say. And I don't have a problem with people not knowing answers. Wise people are ignorant. <laughs> Wise people are, everyone is ignorant, but wise people acknowledge ignorance. I don't have a problem with not having an answer. I have a problem with delegitimizing a person's question because I don't have an answer. Mocking the person, disrespecting the person, insulting the person, chastising the person for no reason. I could say, interesting question, let me call somebody. Let me research it. Why don't you speak to Pliny and Pliny? No problem. But why are you screaming at him? You think you're not answering him? Of course you're answering him. You're answering him that you have no answer. Besides confirming his doubts, you also make him believe that he's a nobody, that he's a horrible person. That's a second evil. We take intelligent kids who are searching for the truth, and what's the price for searching for the truth? You get knocked down and you're made to feel that you are a horrible, horrible person. So it's a fascinating thing. If I'm a child who doesn't search for the truth, <laughs> then my self-esteem gets built up. The child who's inquisitive, the young person who's really searching for MS and struggling with it, these are the people who get put down when they should be the ones who are celebrated, who are embraced. They're wonderful, deep souls. Now, if somebody doesn't have a question, fine. If somebody doesn't have a question, great. There's no mitzvah to go and invent every question that was ever asked and plant them in people's minds. But if somebody is struggling with a question, emotionally, intellectually, experientially, psychologically, spiritually, scholastically, how can I not address it? How can I reject it? A boy came to me, he was a yeshiva, yeshiva here in Muncie, a young boy, 14, 15 years old, very, very wise kid, very, very intelligent. I said, why do you come to me? He says, I'll tell you. He was in a particular school, and he had a certain question, a very interesting question about Jews being the chosen people, one of those questions. And he asked his teacher in class, and the teacher said, Jews don't ask such questions. So he went to another five staff members in the school. There's somebody sitting in this room who can authenticate every detail of the story. He went to five staff of that school. Each one of them either said, we don't ask these questions. Two of them denigrated him for asking the question. Nobody can address it. So he says, at that point, I came home, I told my father, this place is not teaching an iota of truth. Why should I sit here? I'm done. I'm done. So his father said, I want you to speak to one more person. He says, another se a seventh rabbi who's going to mock me? He says, that's why I'm in your office. That's why I'm in your office. So of course, I said, the first thing is, let me give you a hug. And that was probably 40% of the answer. And then I said, you know, it's a wonderful question. And just, just the, the dignity to say it's a wonderful question. It was so meaningful. Not that it provided an answer. But it was the basic dignity a kid is searching for an answer. Why am I mocking him? Now I want to tell you about an interesting, where well, you'll see this point brought out, a very interesting debate between two great, actually, Hasidic masters. There was a Jew, some of you know his works, he was known in his time as Sar Beis HaZoyar, one of the greatest Mekobolim of the day, the Zidichoyva, Reb Tzvi Hirsch Eichenstein of Zidichoyv. He lived in Zidichoyv, which is in Poland, in Galicia. And uh, he was born in 1763. That's three years after the Baal Shem Tov passed away, and he passed away 1831. Sar Beis HaZoyar. 
Reb Tzvi Hirsch of Zidichayf. He has a sefer called Sur Meira Vaseitoyf. In it, he attacks very heavily. I don't know the word attacks. He takes on very, very heavily the Rambam and the Chayva Salavavas. When the Chayva Salavavas writes in his introduction on the Shara Yichud that it's a mitzvah to investigate if there's a God and what type of reality is this God, the, the Zidit Shoeva says, this is of course centuries later, he says, Chalila lecha ha-chosid. How dear the Chosid, the Chayva Salavavas write this. He said he is committing the same sin like the Jews when they came out of Egypt in Parshas B'Shalach and they asked one question. Hayesh Hashem bekirbeinu im oyin. Is God among us or not? He said, what do you mean if he's among you or not? He took you out of Mitzrayim, he split the sea, he gave you Torah, he nurtures you, he embraces you, it's before the giving the Torah. He did everything for you. And suddenly you look at him and say, Ayesha Hashem B'Kebeinu, Yimai Nechayi V'Salavavu says, a Jew has to start asking, is there a God? What is this God? How can you prove it? And he goes on pages, pages, very deeply hurt by this approach. On the book Sur Meirava Seitoiv, there are famous footnotes of the Bnei Yisoschar. They're known as a Sophist Meharav Tzvi Elimelech. The Bnei Yisoschar was another great Hasidic master, a contemporary of Reb Tzvi Yish of Zidichoiv. Reb Tzvi Elimelech Shapiro of Dinov, which is also in Poland in Galicia. He was born in 1783, passed away 1841. Tofresh Aleph, Yud Tevis, right? It's the Ayin for the Bnei Yisoschar, no? Yud Tevis, right? Okay. The Bnei Yisoscha writes comment, uh, footnotes on the Sur Meirava Seitev of the Digit and listen to his comment. Now you have to know the Bnei Yisoscha. Anybody who knows the Bnei Yisoscha works knows how much he criticizes the philosophers. Especially in his generation where the Haskalah, the Enlightenment, took such deep, it became so entrenched in Jewish life. The Bnei Yisoscha speaks about Emunah and Mesoira beyond Seichel, beyond your own investigation. This is the Bnei Yisoscha. But when the Zidit is so upset at the Rambam and the Chayva Salavavis for their approach. The Bnei Yisoschar, Reb Tzvi Elimelech, Shapiro of Dinov, says, and I quote a line, he says, Harav medaber mikirois liboy migoidel emunosu yotchukosay l'Hashem. The Halek Yisidit is speaking from the depth of his heart because of the deep faith and craving he had for God. But he said, I don't understand them. The Jews who left Mitzrayim, they saw Hashem. They saw it happen. When they say, Ayesh Hashem bekerbeinu imayin, ooh, it's a sin. He says, but today, we don't see. We don't have that experience. He says, somebody who wants to love God, he wants a relationship with God, but he can't. And therefore, he says, I have to go ask questions. He says, how can you call this a sin? And then the Bnei Yisoschar adds, what, what did Avram Avinu do? Would the Chayva, would, would the Adzidit Shreva tell this to Avram Avinu also? Imagine Avram Avinu comes to Terach. Imagine, yeah? He says, Terach, what do we believe in? He says, we believe, you see this nice getchke here? You want a good shidduch? You daven to him. And Avram Avinu says, could you prove it? It seems to me like a piece of granite, an expensive piece of granite. Terach says, prove it? Emuna. Emuna. Avram says, what Emuna? Prove it. I have a tradition. My father was in this business. My Zaydi was, this is how we pay tuition. This is how we pay for the mortgage. This is how we send you to college. This is how we pay off the mortgage. What do you mean? This is how we do it. Avram says, I'm looking for truth. I'm not looking to pay the mortgage. I'm looking for truth. Terech says, Apikur says, Arois. I like Nocher and Horan. Nocher and Horan are good kids. And Avram Avinu would have accepted this. Oy vahavoy. Thank God Avram Avinu said, I don't believe stupidity. I don't believe stupidity. And he takes a hammer and he crashes, crushes stupidity, both conceptually and physically. So he says, of course he has to investigate. Avram Avinu investigated. He, wasn't, he didn't have a matan tayra yitzis mitzayim. He didn't have that. What is he supposed to do? If Terach would have told him apikairis and Avram Avinu would say, okay, I'm not going to ask any more questions, there would be no Jew in the world, there would be no Judaism in the world. True, the Bnei Yisoschar says. Philosophy confused many, many people. The Bnei Yisoschar knows that. But he says, how can you attack a person who's investigating? Because he has questions. Again.
understand. If there's no questions, great. Now understand, even if there's no questions, there's still the shit of the Chayvah Salavavas. Ask. Even so, not because the Chayvah Salavavas had doubts. He said, just like Hashem wants you to shake a lulav, to put on tefillin, to eat matzah on Pesach, He wants you to know Him. Others had different approaches. That's even if there's no question. But if there's a question, the Bnei says, what do you do? What do you want from the person? What are you going to tell him? Don't ask. What did you do? You convinced him that way? You gave him a muna that way? I want to illustrate the debate between these two people, the Zidr Shreva, the Bnei Yisachar, both from the very, very world, the very heavy world of Nister, the very inspired world of Nister, of Kabbalah, of Chassidus. I want to illustrate it, okay? You come to your son, your 21-year-old son, and you say, Yanki, it's time to go to the chuppah, you light the candles, you take him under his arm, and you start going to the chuppah. And on the way, Yankee turns to you, to his father, and he says, one second, can we prove that you're my father? Could you please bring me your ksuva? I want to see your ksuva, so you bring your ksuva. He says, no, I'm not sure you're my father. Let's do a DNA test. So you're under the chuppah, you say, I'm not sure he's my father. Let's stop this chuppah. Let's go test DNA. Let's see if there's a match. You look at your son and you say, are you crazy? For 21 years, I held you, I supported you, I fed you, I nurtured you, I protected you, I loved you. Everything you have, I gave you. I paid now for this trimal, for this bekshir. I'm supporting you for the next eight and a half years in Koilu. I bought you a house. I paid for this whole wedding, $95,000. I'm going to be in debt for eight years. Why did I do it? Because I'm not your father? With this audacity that you need DNA to prove that I'm your father. That's what the Zidit Shoiva is feeling. That's what the Bnei Sosko says. He sees God. He's having dvekas with God. And you're telling me, uh, so according to the Big Bang, God, a little DNA, bring me your ksuva. The Zidit Shoiva is alarmed. He feels it. He experiences it. But the Bnei Sosko responds, wait, wait a second. The Bistahel you see, You see how sophisticated people argue. He says, Of course he speaks like this. But now I have a question. What if a child is adopted? What if a boy is adopted and a man walks in and says, I'm your father. What does he say? Yeah, yeah, you're my father. Come, take me to the chuppah. Let's go do a DNA test. So the Meisoskur says, what do you want? People are experiencing God. People are seeing God. This generation saw God, this generation saw Auschwitz. People have questions. What are you going to mock them? You're going to denigrate them? Address them. Yeah. Some of them need explanation. They need to understand. They need perspective. If they don't have questions, great. But if yes, this is what the Bnei Yisachar is responding. Thus it's clear that the idea that uh, Judaism is based on not thinking. On thinking it may be a lie, but you know what? I just say it's true. This is absolutely ridiculous. It's ludicrous. Somebody told me today that he was at a tish by the Kloisenberger Rebbe. And the Kloisenberger Rebbe says at the Tish a story, I guess an anecdote. There was an old Jew who was on his deathbed. And he turns to his family and he says, before I go, I have to do something. And he goes, the Kloisenberger Rebbe says this at his Tish. He goes, and in the basement, he finds a Tselem. A cross on a Hepzichon Selem, and he starts uh, crossing himself. You? What are you doing? He says, listen, I'm about to die, and you never know, what if I come there and I find out that they were right? <laughs> he says, <laughs> Okay. The Kleisenberg Rebbe was bringing something out. He says, that's what some people think. Amun is. Okay. I happen to grow up here, and if I grow up there, it would have been different. Now, let's understand 
There's something even fundamentally, very deeply flawed about this. And that is, this is such an embarrassment <laughs> and denigration to Judaism. Somebody who fundamentally believes that the only way we can deal with questions is by laughing from them or mocking them, it's a disgrace to Yiddishkeit. Here is the rule. Fear of questions often comes from a lack of confidence. When you don't have answers, you're afraid of questions. When you have answers, you're not afraid of questions. Judaism was never ever afraid of questions. The reason it wasn't afraid of questions is because its basis is based on truth. And truth is never afraid of questions. Even the view that says you don't need a research. If you don't have questions, you could just trust the Messiah. It's not that they're ever afraid of questions. Is they say you don't need it and you'll reach into a deeper place. Never coming out of fear. Avram Avinu wasn't afraid of questions. Avram Avinu broke all the slumming of his day. That is the definition of a Jew. He doesn't believe in idols. He doesn't believe in things because that's the status quo, because it's easy. He looks for truth and only truth. Avram Avinu wasn't afraid of questions. The definition of a Jew is he breaks all the idols. He wants to know what is truth. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for what is comfortable and what his father says is comfortable, what his mother says is comfortable. He's looking for emes, and he's not afraid to find that truth, to discover that truth, and to explore that truth. Nobody was afraid of questions throughout all of Jewish history. Not Avram, not Moshe, not Yeshaya, not Yirmiya, not Eoiv, not the Tanoim, not the Amiroim, not the Psad Yigon, not the Rambam, not the Chayvah Salavavis, not the Sefer Achinuch, not the Yehuda Levi. Not the Arizal, not the Beis Yosef, not the Balatanya, not the Vilna Gon, not the Chaim Velozhne, not the Chofetz Chaim, not the Lubavitcher Rebbe. None of them were afraid of questions. Why were they not afraid of questions? They were not afraid of questions because truth is never fearful of questions. Even if it doesn't always believe that everyone has to engage it. And everybody needs to ask these questions. Somebody asked me once a question in the middle of a shear said, are you in a cult? They asked me if I'm in a cult. So I said, uh, it reminded me once in yeshiva, somebody came over to me and said, as an outsider, what is your opinion of the human race? <laughs> so I told him, judging on you, terrible. I said, you're asking me if I'm in a cult that presupposes that you're not in a cult. So you have the liberty to ask me. He says, forget about me. I want to know if you think you're in a cult. I say, here, here's the deal. If I'm really in a cult, you don't think I would know that I'm in a cult. People who are in cults usually don't acknowledge they're in cults. He says, right, but you're intelligent at least to understand that. So could you prove to me that you're not in a cult? So I said, let's not talk about me. Let's talk about you for a moment. It'll be easier so I could be a little more objective. He says, let's talk about me. How do I know I'm not in a cult? I said, I don't think so. Maybe you are in a cult. I can't say you're not in a cult. He says, if I wasn't, how do I know? I said, rule number one is to ask this question continuously. People who are in cults don't like these questions. If you can ask this question and say, how do I know I'm not in a cult consistently? You're probably not in a cult. But you have to be able to really confront the question and find out if you are or not. But then I said, I'll tell you the real answer. I know people who are in cults, I've dealt with them quite uh, not so infrequently. The first rule they tell you when you join a cult is, don't speak to people outside. Why? Because they're afraid that they're going to plant in you a question you won't be able to answer. So they want to isolate you from anybody who doesn't agree with your view. And if you ask questions, they will not allow you to ask questions because what they want is, they want to crush your intelligence and your creativity, so you shouldn't ask questions. So I said, wherever you grow up in a system, that the main message is, never speak to people who don't look like you, never have conversations with people who disagree with you, never listen to an argument or a question, and they never allow you to ask questions, it's dangerous. You should ask yourself if you're in a cult. If Judaism would have ever done this, I, for one, could not be here.
This is the worst sign. This is the sign of the death of truth. And the first Jew knew the prerequisite for any discovery of truth is I don't have idols. I smash idols. I look for truth. Just because something is an idol and people worship it has nothing to do with Emmas. You know, I once saw a word from Reb Shimon Shkop. Reb Shimon Shkop was a student of Reb Chaim Brisker. He was the Rosh Hashiva of Grodna in Lithuania. Passed away in 1940, right before the war. He was author Shari Yosher, or Chudusha Reb Shimon Yudah Hakoyim. He writes something fascinating. He said something fascinating. The Gemara says in Brachas that the beginning of Shemun Esra we identify Hashem as Elikei Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. The God of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. How do we end the first blessing? Baruch Atah Hashem. Mogen Avram. The shield of Avram. Why not the shield of Yitzchak and Yaakov? Why did Yitzchak and Yaakov get deleted from the end of the blessing? So the Gemara says in Brachas, we learn that out from the Pesukim and Parshas Lech Lecha. That you begin davening with all the three of us. At the end, we conclude only with you, with Avram. So Reb Shimon Shkop explained homiletically that Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov had very different experiences of Judaism. Yitzchak had a father. He was Avram Avinu. He could look up to him. Yaakov had a father and a grandfather. What about Avram? If he would look up to his father... He would not be Avram Avinu. His father was a Terach, and his mother was an Amasloi, who the Gemara says conceived him while she was a Nidr. So Avram Avinu had to own his Judaism. He had to discover God on his own. He couldn't say, I learned from my father, I learned from my Zayda. Throughout Jewish history, there were different types of Jews. There's the Jew of Avram, there's the Jew of Yitzhak, there's the Jew of Yaakov, there's the Jew who discovers it on his own, there's the Jew who discovers it based on his father, there's the Jew who's inspired by a father and a Zayda. Two generations. He says, at the end of Jewish history, at the end of Golos, you finish with Avram, Mogan Avram. He says, there's going to come a generation where Jews are going to go back to Avram. They're going to have to discover their own God. They will not be able to rely on and live off the God of their father, the God of their grandfather, the God of their great, great, great grandfather, as powerful as that is. A generation that needs to find their own relationship. We are experiencing that generation. We are experiencing thousands and thousands of young men and women, or middle-aged men and women, or older men and women, who are asking a lot of questions. You know why? Because they want to have a real relationship with Hashem. Because they want Yiddishkeit to be really meaningful. Instead of we seizing the opportunity and saying, wow, we have Avram Avinus, what do we do? We mock them. We denigrate them. We insult them. Some of us throw them out of our houses. We alienate them. We put them on meds. Stupidity. They don't fit into my box, so they need meds. Because they don't fit in exactly to my stigmas and my box. I'm not talking if they really need meds. I'm talking about meds because they have certain questions, so they're not normal. Maybe they're normal. <laughs> Maybe they're a little more honest. They don't want to lie. They don't want to repress. This is a generation. They want to find Hashem. They want to have a real, they want to have an experiential relationship. A real relationship. And sometimes that comes with a lot of searching, a lot of scrutiny, a lot of questions. Now you're going to ask me, so how do you answer these questions? <laughs> how do you answer these questions? Now that's a good question. That's a good question. Sometimes my answer has to be honest. You know what? I don't know. Great question. I don't know. Let me think about it. Let me, let's search together. Let's go to somebody. Let's read. Let's find out. That's great. Sometimes I have to determine if the questions are maybe coming from deep emotional pain. Let's understand. If people have been abused by very religious rabbis or teachers, they will blame religion for their trauma. And they will already find a lot of questions. If you don't address the pain, you're not addressing their questions. Sometimes... 
People are skeptical and cynical just because they're afraid or just because they're looking for justifications. I have to search what's happening. And sometimes there are authentic questions that I really have to address. So yes, there are different approaches and different responses, but the common denominator is when people have questions, I can't ignore them and make believe they're just going to go away. At last, you're going to ask this very legitimate question. So what is emuna? <laughs> what is faith? You just said there's no such a thing. Why do we call it emuna pshuta? Emuna pshuta! Or emuna pshita, simple faith. And why did I learn in all the holy works that emuna is higher than seichel? It's higher than rationality. And why did it say that the Baal Shem Tev said, Ich will sein anar, I want to be a fool. And the Medrash says, Pesi yamin l'chol dover zem Moshe Rabbeinu. A fool who believes everything is Moshe Rabbeinu. Shmoy Rabbeinu. What is happening? According to what you said. What's the standard of Amunah? Amunah pshuta, higher than seichel. What makes it higher than rationality? What is this Amunah pshuta? Simple faith. So I'm going to say this very briefly, even though this needs elaboration and explanation. Emunah pshuta doesn't mean simple faith. It's a very distorted translation. In fact, our definition of what we call emunah is an error. It's an error. And the source of this is in Tanya in chapter 18 and 19. If you want uh, more, you have the Rapshitz Zerah Kodesh in Parshas Vayikra. has a whole shtickle on this and many other works, especially in Nister. The definition of emunah is something else. Emunah has nothing to do with being an idiot. Emunah has nothing to do with being blind. Emunah has nothing to do with being dumb. Emunah has nothing to do with closing your eyes and saying, brainwash me, please, please, just brainwash me. Nothing to do with emunah. That's not emunah pshuta. That's not higher than seichel. So what is emunah? Emunah is never afraid of questions. Emunah is never afraid of intellect. Emunah never competes with rationality. Emunah is this. A Jewish soul is a chelik eleka mimal mamash. A Jewish soul is a piece of Hashem, a fragment of God. Thus, the soul has eyes that see the Reboi Nishalayla. They experience intimately Hashem's reality. This is what emunah pshuta means. Pshuta doesn't mean simple. Pshuta comes from the word mufshut, divested. It's an emuna that does not need equations, mathematics, explanations, rationality to prove that there is an existence of God. There's a dimension of the human psyche called the neshama that experiences Hashem like we experience reality with our five senses. In other words, emuna is a sense it's the sixth sense of the soul. It's the perception. It's the, it's the ability of the soul. The capacity of the soul. That when cultivated, allows the soul and us to experience ultimate reality. It can be plugged, just like I can plug my ears on the airplane not to hear noise. I can put a, I could blindfold my eyes not to see. But emuna is an essential dimension of the soul that experiences Hashem in an immediate fashion. That's what the Zidr Shaiva was talking about. <laughs> you grew up with a father for 21 years. You see him every day. He was there for you through thick and thin. And suddenly on the way to the chuppah, you said, prove to me that you're my father. Bring the ksuva. Really? We experience life together. Not that DNA will miss this. Not that we're afraid of DNA. I'm not afraid if... <laughs> I had once a son who tends to me, Tati, prove to me that I'm not adopted. I said, if you really want, I could prove it. I'm not afraid of it. But of course it was a joke. I mean, he was in a mood, whatever. He didn't get ice cream, so he decided he was adopted. Fine. Emunah doesn't compete with rationality. It's not afraid of it. It doesn't run from it. It's beyond it. It's another dimension of experiencing. I see it. It experiences Hashem. It's an immediate reality. It's a whole different concept. It's beyond seichel. It doesn't compete with it. That's what Emunah means. That's what Emunah pshut is. Nothing to do with I just believe it because you said it. It doesn't make sense. It's stupid. I just say I believe. If I would have grown up somewhere else, I would have said the same thing. That has nothing to do with Emunah. That has to do with intellectual laziness, as I said. 
You know the story, yeah? They say there was once a uh, Pavarotti, the great opera singer, did a rendition of Psalm chapter 30, uh, 23. Hashem Ra'ilei the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Pavarotti did a beautiful rendition, and then an Altaid, an old Jew, gets up and says, Can I do my rendition? He says, Sure. And he starts doing his rendition of Tehillim Chav Gimel. He doesn't know how to read, he doesn't know how to pronounce, doesn't know how to carry a tune. But he, he was a real Jew. So he said it with his whole soul, and people started to cry. So they say at the end, Pavarotti turned to him and said, I don't understand. I did a magnificent job. Impeccable, flawless. Nobody cried. They applauded me, but nobody cried. You get up. You did a horrible job on every level. You get klept avart sa avart. On notits to a note to a note. There was nothing right about what you did, but everybody was crying. What's the difference? I also did the Lord as my shepherd. You did. The, what's the difference? He says, Pavarotti, I'll explain to you the difference. You know the song but I know the shepherd. That makes the difference. That means, the Tanya says in chapter 29, if a Jew comes to you and he says, I have sveikas in Amuna, that's a sentence that is irrational. You never have sveikas in Amuna. You have sveikas in Seichel. You never have. No Jew in history ever did or ever will have sveikas in Amuna. You can't have a doubt in Amuna. There's no Sveikas in Amuna. Amuna is the experience of a Neshama. It's the oneness of a soul with God, which is unconditional. Every single Jew, no matter who he or she is, no matter where they grow up, no matter how much they know and how much they observe. This is the essential dynamic of the soul. It's the color of the soul. I can't change the color of my eyes. I can't change the color of my soul. Sveikas in Amun I don't have. I have confusions in my intellectual capacity to make peace between my rational identity and my Amunah. That's fine. And therefore, once one experiences Amunah, the role of Seichel is never to be underestimated. It serves a beautiful role, and that is to allow the Amunah to permeate even my intellect, to remove the blockages, the partition that the intellect imposes on Amunah. That is the role of it. But there's never a competition between them. There's never a fight between them. I want to conclude with a story that happened not long ago that I think illustrates this at least to some degree. Anti-Semitism has grown dramatically in Europe, in recent years, including in Hungary, in Ungarn, where some of you uh, can trace back your ancestry to, your blessed ancestry to, your Messiah, your Messiah. Part of the anti-Semitism uh, outbreak in Hungary is due to a very successful fascist, anti-Semitic political party called Jabok. That's the name of the party. It's pronounced Jab it's, it's written Jabuk, it's pronounced Yabuk. And the leader of that party is a young Hungarian man. His name is Chanad Zegedi. Chanad Zegedi. Tall, powerful, brilliant communicator, handsome, wise, clever, great oratory, great oratory skills, and a lot of charisma. And he became one of the leaders of this party, a very young man. And he really made it extremely popular and successful. He also founded a paramilitary group fashioned based on the Nazi type of marches during the Second World War. And uh, he and his party preach open anti-Semitism. They blame the Jews on most of the problems in the world. And of course, all the problems in Hungary is the fault of the Jews and the gypsies, if that makes you feel better is the Jews and the Gypsies. His party and his mouth spewed Jew hatred, anti-Semitism, horrible things about Israel and the Jewish people, and uh, dark illusions and horrible humor about Jewish power, and the Jewish obsession to take over the world. This was Chana Zegedi. Zegedi. He was the star of the party, and a rising star in Hungary, the party managed to get three seats in, uh, in the parliament. And he was one of, the, one of the members of the Hungarian parliament. And this continued until one day he made a discovery and it changed his life forever. It was a cozy afternoon in April 2012. 
He went to visit his 92-year-old grandmother who lived in a suburb in Hungary. And he was schmoozing with his grandmother. And out of the blue, she rolled up her sleeve and she pointed to a number tattooed on her arm. And she looked at him and she said, let me tell you my story. In 1945, I was a young Hungarian woman. I was liberated from the hell of Auschwitz. My mother died when I was a baby. My aunt and uncle adopted me. They were taken to Auschwitz. They were murdered. Our entire family was murdered, together with almost one million Hungarian Jews who were murdered in 1944. I survived the gas chambers and I emerged from Auschwitz after the liberation in 1945, starved, emaciated, I looked like a skeleton, I was beaten, I was crushed, I had nobody in the world. My trauma convinced me that to be Jewish was a serious liability. If the Holocaust would happen again, again the Jews would be targeted. I married a Jewish survivor in a perfectly orthodox wedding, a Jewish religious halachic wedding. He was also in Auschwitz. Shortly after the wedding, we decided together, why do we have to impose this liability on our children? We will hide our Jewishness forever. We will never tell our children that they belong to the Jewish people. We changed our last names to a perfect Hungarian, non-Jewish sounding name. And we committed that we would never reveal the secret to anybody that we are Jewish. Nobody knew us. We were alone in the world. All of our relatives were murdered by the Germans. This wasn't difficult. We started a new life. We had a daughter. Her name is Catalin. And our greatest nachas was when she came home with a perfectly handsome, good-looking Hungarian shagitz. And he mar she married him. And we looked at each other and we said, success. She married a regular Hungarian non-Jew. And in 1982, when you, Chanad, were born to a Hungarian father and our daughter, Kathleen, this for us meant that we could look away from our horrific dark past as a new chapter in our life ultimately took root. We were regular Hungarian non-Jews. She looked at her grandson and she said, so I want you to know that I'm Jewish. Your mother is Jewish. And therefore, you're also Jewish. Now understand, this wasn't just a challenge to his career, to his accomplishments, to his vocation, to his future. This was a shock to his very sense of self. He was the anti-Semite. He was the Jew hater. He was the one who explained to the world how horrible the Jews are. And he is the Jew. He is the Jew. And he looked at his grandmother and he says, why did we never see this number? She said, in the winter I always made sure that to wear sleeves and in the summer I would put plaster on it. She didn't want to stand out. I would put plaster on the numbers so nobody would be able to identify it. And now suddenly, his anti-Semitism, his racism, his fascism, which is who he was or who he thought he was, was now all delegitimized by this moment. He made a call to his best friend, and he told him what he just heard. And what did his best friend tell him? What would you tell your friend? His best friend said, the best thing that can happen to you right now is, I take a gun and I shoot your brains out. It's literally the biggest favor I can do for you at this moment in your life. 32-year-old man, because what are you supposed to do now? You know what he did? Shana Jagedi did two things. Two things. Number one, he went immediately to the party leaders, and he broke the news to them that he's Jewish, and he gave in his resignation. They didn't want to accept his resignation, they said, it's good to have you because it's called the Pope Jews. We'll have token Jews so we could say we're not anti-Semitic. We even have a Jew. It's a great cover-up. He said, no, no way. I'm done with you. I'm Jewish. You know what else he did? He called up the Chabad Shliach in Budapest, Rabbi Shloyme Kovash, who himself is a Balchuva from Budapest. 
And he gets on the phone. Rabbi Kovash answers the phone. He says, hi, this is Shana Jagedi. He's like, what? He says, I'm a Jew and I want to become Jewish. So imagine I would get a call from, I don't know, Malcolm X. Uh, I would get a call from Lou Sharpton. I don't know. Say, Rabbi Jacobson, I'm Jewish. Uh, could you, could you, can I come to Yeshir and look at the Torah and Masech Rosh Hashanah? So I'm sure going to go to a psychiatrist. So Shloyme Kovesh, this is like, it's like, a neo, it's like a neo-Nazi, a fascist, calling up a Chabad Shliach that he's Jewish, he wants to learn Judaism. So he thought he's making a joke because that's what anti-Semites do. They like joking, they like mocking. So he hung up on him. He insisted, he called and he said, I am not making jokes. I am Jewish. And finally he realized that this is real. He says, I want to meet you. And he meets him and he sees this is the man. And he tells him the story. He says, what am I supposed to do? So he looks him in the eyes and he says, listen, Judaism believes in tshuva. Judaism believes in return, in repentance. You can transform your life. Now it's time to study, to discover your roots, and to create a new future for yourself. But one more thing. Real tshuva means not running away from the past, but transforming the past. So your tshuva is going to be when you will seize the opportunity and use all of your influence to fight anti-Semitism in Hungary. All everything you know about anti-Semitism and everything you did, you need to transform by using your position, your influence, your sphere of influence and impact to change that. This man at the age of 32 had a bris. He had a circumcision. He began learning Torah every single day with Rabbi Shloy Makovish. Put on a talus cotton. He comes today three times a day to his shul, to Davin Shachis Men Chemaidev. The first few weeks when the Jews came into the shul and they saw who's standing there, they threw him out of shul. But after a few weeks, they calmed down and they accepted him. One year after this uh, discovery, his grandmother dies. She's 93 years old and he decides it's time to go to Auschwitz. He goes to Auschwitz and he described it in an interview. He said, I was standing at the crematorium and suddenly he says, I quote, I burst out crying, I break down. I thought I'm standing by the graveside of my family, the people I never knew. I always claimed that the Holocaust was not bad. The Jews made a big story, they dramatized it. And here I was standing at the graveside of all of my ancestors who were murdered here. I want people to understand Jews. Anti-Semites don't understand who Jews are. They know nothing about Jews. Certainly he would know. He was one of them. His wife is now converting to Yiddishkeit according to Halacha. All of his sons had a bris. They were circumcised. And he embarked on a mission to talk to schools, groups, colleges, anyone who will hear his story about the toxicity of anti-Semitism. He tells them why at the age of 17, feeling empty, pushed and empty, he needed something to believe in, and Jews were a great scapegoat. And this is what he talks about, that you will not create a good life for yourself by hating others. They asked him, what does your father feel about this? Remember, his father is the real non-Jew. He says, my father thinks I'm crazy. My father looked at me and said, why in the world would you want to be Jewish? Why in the world? Who needs this? And I told my father, it's not about what I want. It's about who I am. Besides, it's not a curse. It's a gift. He says, then I had to tell my father that I had a bris. I had a circumcision. I knew if I tell it to him regularly, he would literally kill me. So what did I do? Once we were on an airplane, and as we were landing, our seatbelts were fastened. I turned to him and I said, Daddy, I had a circumcision. I hoped that for the next few minutes, by the time the plane lands, he would calm down. And right then, he was in a seatbelt, the plane was landing, he wouldn't be able to beat, to beat the living daylights out of me. And I actually just read a few weeks ago, somebody sent to me that he's planning now to move to, move to the Holy Land. Here you have an example of what a munapshuta is. This did not come from a life of a person who was entrenched in Shas and Poskim, in Rishonim and Achroinim, in Mesoira and Chazal, in Torah and Mitzvahs. Not only that, he dedicated his life to fight it. But you can't change the color of your soul. Your soul is essentially one with God, and therefore it experiences it. 
This is never afraid of intellect. It transcends it. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Thursday. You wanted number one. Yeah, 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 yeah I got it. We're saying we're saying how ends and when it begins. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Ah. Shalom Aleichem, how are you? Thank you for coming. I saw you also two weeks ago when you yeah. came for the astronomy, 5.30 in the morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Jacob. You're welcome. Beautiful. Likewise, thank you. What a powerful story to wrap it up. Beautiful. Beautiful. Very you. powerful. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm still stuck with that question, what happened to the rabbis? Why, do, why did it end? Which rabbis? The rabbis saying that in the past, the father saying, oh, I saw miracles, I saw miracles. Where is the rabbis that we're finding nowadays with the miracles? What happened? Go ahead, go ahead. Maybe you don't have such a I don't know what. What's the... Every generation is it? But to base a Yiddishkeit on a moifus here and there. I'm just asking what happened in that. It's a good question. Not every generation has such subject. If you the parents, that question falls away. 100%. I'm just. Skaya. Thank you so much. Ask him. Ask him. Yeah, yeah. How am I getting to it? The moon is always there. No matter what, the moon is there. Sometimes I feel it, sometimes I don't feel it, but it's there. But then I can't I mean, say my mother is not my mother. My mother is my mother. Sometimes I feel it, sometimes I don't. And There's always a relationship. Isn't that a time that I need to have the Muna? The Muna that's called that I, I need don't to have, have to have it, it's there. So he's asking about the belief. He's asking about the that's belief. That's we, we explain that there's no such a yeah, thing. Yeah, right. So What's belief? So what is belief? Try to use the logic to get to experience uh, the, 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 the real The logic problem. won't help you experience it. The logic just removes the blockages removes of the logic blockages. on the Muna. Uh -huh. You understand? The but logic is feeling. If it's anyway something not logic, then it's it's not negay in the logic. I'm telling you, no. It's the husband is chametatat. The dust up in DNA to prove that he's your father. That's a, that's a great model. Yeah. Is it going to be a stitter? You want to bring DNA? Bring DNA. I don't care. You want to bring DNA? Bring DNA. I know I'm your father. I'm not afraid of questions. But this wouldn't help the feeling. Why? Why, why I feel this? Yeah. It's, it's going to be moisif. Hey, you're going to bring DNA. Oh, now I love you. Tap the now. Give me a hug. It's going to be moisif amazing, something. Right, amazing. It's not a stinus, it's bring. I'm not afraid of your shyness. DNA will also prove it. If it's the truth, it's the truth. Ich darf es nicht. A mun is a zach, a kasha macht es nicht schwache, und a teretz macht es nicht starke. Verstehst? Ich bin a seichel de kazach. Ich weiß nicht, ob du bist mein Tat. Bring DNA, wird man sagen. Oh, aus der Reihe, pss, meure dich. We proved without a doubt that this is a father. Yeah, but, uh, but if, if, if a true father and a true son... True father? DNA, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't it's going to be moist if yeah. now that there's DNA... Oh, now I'm more convinced. Now there's taken no svekas by me. It's a It's not moist if anything. It's not moist if anything. It's not if anything. It's not if anything. For somebody else, if I was adopted, if I'm a tinnik shenishba, yeah, this is it. I don't have anything else. You yes. Amen. Also, just to aggravate them, and I'm not going to do that. 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 I'm not going to do the, 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 the animal came from the front, he put him in the back, came from the back, put him in the front, and then the son says, Where's my father? Where's my father? So that's when Amalek came. Yeah. So the caliph comes to bite him. You grew up with a father, he saved your life a thousand times. What's next to where's my father? Where's my father? So but if you didn't grow up with a father, yeah, you say, Where's my do I have a father? 
So the Beis Hashem says, "What's will stuff for They will listen. For Kate, he wants a father. That's why he's searching. What's will stuff for But this might have been the reason. No, that's why it was the Rebbe given as a einish. How come? How could this happen? Ah, that's for extra good to Shiloh. We can run in the middle. I've never seen a father that was so close to the son that she has before. That's a good question. That's a good. How did they talk to do it? It's a part of the lecture. That, that, that's that's a good question. How do you understand all of it? You can ask and everybody can ask and Kairach with the Miraglim and the Messiah and Huh? So it's brought different Pirush and one Pirush is the question is Ayesh Hashem Bikirbeinu Imayan. They wanted to know if Hashem is Bikirbeinu. That's already a different Bikhina. He's really Bikirbeinu inside of me, inside my Kishkas. Kravayim a Kishkas, yeah. The Chol Kravay is Shem Kotcha. Okay, so that's why I be your name of them. I guess you need like to come more to the morning. Yeah. The morning sheet for this. Yeah, is Next sheet. Because the Tayyar state, the question was if Hashem is the Pchin of Yesh or Ayin. Hayesh Hashem Bekirbeinu im Ayin. If Getlech Kait is Yesh or the Getlech Kait is Ayin. It's a Shana Tifer Abir. It's Mamushas if it's if it's. Yeah. If Getlech Kait is Yesh or the Ayin. Mande, Mande Shaila. It's a good Eidel Shaila. I'll be pshat. It's like a given a grace of chet. Well, as I'm not gezen. Look, he gained for Daniel Shilas. You can go skiing. So it's post skiing. I'm skiing is not chana. I got most geshirben. I know, but I'm not going to go to the castle. I'm not going to go to I wasn't even supposed to get an item. I guess. He's in the house. I think I had the sheer. I think I had the cash for someone to get past me. Is it the double market? Is it the truth? Is it true? The double market, yeah. I got an IMV. Treffen this. No, he said with the arrow, West. But have you reflect? We have to marshal our faults. As I said, when I eat, was he the arrow? Was given by the commitment. We mark this. The cancer is chosen. Ik zeg vrier schissig. En dan mag ik het niet meer. Ik heb vrier aan Marshall. Dat voor het zustand je vindt, ik heb ze aan mij ze aanpassen. Dat geef ik me de Marshall. Dus dat gaat toch aan die maas. Ik ga wel geven met een schier. I want to thank also about the shirim before Purim. That was was a major spark from the whole. Very good shirim. Thank you, Valdi. I was thinking that the teacher actually told me that at some point I was going to have to accept. And even for this, you have to, I have to accept that my neshama is just going to feel at some point, right? Because that's not something I could logically understand. Well, there's two different dimensions. There's Judaism that you can understand. That's Seichel. And Munna doesn't need understanding. Munna is an experience of the soul. But then there's the Hashem. There's other things that we pass, like the Chantan, pass down to us. So how do we know who to trust? What? There's, that's bad Hashem. There's certain things that we get passed down from our teachers. So I don't know which that you can trust. investigate. That you can use well, your mind. Which, there has to be one person that you could just believe everything that they say. Like, uh, like let's say. But that itself you can investigate based on what? Like let's say the the person who wrote Stormy Rav Asito, that Rabbah. So he said that that you shouldn't investigate. And then if I just read that, I wouldn't know the other. That's why you came to the Shir. Exactly, but before I came to the shir, I would be believing that. Imagine so that's why you learn it. Then I would have been believing the wrong thing. You're right. That happens. Not okay. So I'm not supposed to be shining down. Then, I, then I'm not gonna. Then I can't trust anything because if I know that forty. You could trust line, people who tell you that you can't trust them. Those are the people you trust. So they tell you that you can't trust them. Yeah, the people that tell you you can't trust them. Those are the people you trust. Can I trust them? <laughs> no. In other words, no. I'm serious. People who tell you, research, see if I'm right. But you told me that um, I must be fighting something, and that's why I'm not accepting anything you're saying. So what am I supposed to say? That? Like, what? But she's, <laughs> but she's, she's a very nice person. She's not. I'm not down. She's a nice person. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. So I shouldn't be shutting down my thinking, and I should be. Of course not. Never. Never what shut down thinking sense. ever. What are you supposed if she makes to sense, fine. She's saying that um, at some point you're going to have to accept. That accept that. what? That they have to accept that my neshama is going to feel that I can't. That you don't accept. That's an experience. You don't have to accept it. Also, if you're accepting it, it's not a muna. Yeah. I said that you're trained to think in an old way, so you didn't get this sheer fully. You have to listen to it again. I have to show these notes to that teacher. Huh? I have to show these notes to that. You heard what I said? What I said just now, or you didn't understand? 
you're still learning a moon in the old way. You want to know how this fits into Nasa Vinishma? You're saying this contradicts the Shir. Now let me explain to you. You hear the question? The Jewish tradition says Nasa Vinishma. We will do, and then we will hear, then we will understand. Now the first you have to do before you understand. That means first you have to do, even though you don't understand anything. Right? That's your question. When did the Jews say Nasa Vinishma? <laughs> when did the Jews say Nasa Vinishma? When? When they stood at Mount Sinai. Why did they say Nasa Vinishma? If somebody would have come over to them and said, We're giving you 630, I'm giving you 613 commandments, accept it. Why? We don't ask. Just say yeah. And you accept it. If somebody comes over to you in the street and says, I'm giving you a diet, an exercise, 613 exercises a day, and you just say yeah, it's foolish. The Jews said Nasa Vinishma after the exodus of Egypt, <laughs> after the ten plagues, after the splitting of the sea, after the manna, after the well of Miriam, after the clouds of glory. They understood there's a God. God liberated them from Egypt. Hashem said, I want to give you a Torah. They said, we don't have to see, we trust you. Nasa Vinishma means there's a recognition of Hashem's presence, of Hashem's reality. It's not just blind faith, the earth is flat, okay, the earth is flat. Let me, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say, I mean, we have to have a shear on this, but I'll give you a short example. Let's say, I'm not feeling well. Okay. I go to the doctor. I have a doctor, I go to him for years. He gives me a prescription. I don't know what it says in the prescription. I also never went to medical school. I don't understand exactly how this medicine is going to help my illness. Will I do it? Yeah. Why? I trust the doctor. Am I stupid for trusting the doctor? No. He's helped me in the past. He has a good reputation. Everyone says he's a good doctor. He has a license. <laughs> he graduated. He's had a practice. Thousands of people come see him. It makes sense for me to trust the doctor, but if somebody meets me in the street and says, oh, you're going to the doctor, I say, oh, you don't have to go to the doctor. I'll give you a prescription. And this is exactly what you should do. I have to be stupid to follow him. Nasa v'nishma means I don't have to understand the meaning behind every mitzvah before I do it. But I have to appreciate the fact that it's coming from a place of truth, from ultimate truth. And it's here for my benefit. Doesn't mean it's blind and it's stupid. Nasa v'nishma, the Jews saw Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, they saw Kriyas Yamsuf. They said, ah, if this is who we're having a relationship with, I'm in. I don't have to know everything you're going to tell me. I trust you. But the trust was based on a deep recognition. Dude, does it mean I, I should understand? I should understand, but that's after Nasa, Nasa Vinishma. There's another point I want to say. You get it? You get what I'm saying? There has to be a basic recognition. It's not just blind, blind. It doesn't make sense. I told you to do it. Who's, uh, who are you? Tell me who you are. The word Kabbalah's oil comes with the word Malchus Shamayim, accepting the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. You have to appreciate. God created you. He loves you unconditionally. He's crazy about you. He wants your greatest good, and this is the yoke he gives you to actualize yourself. More about this in future classes. I just want to say another point. If somebody gets very sick, they go to the doctor, the doctor gives them a medicine. They say, I'm not going to take this medicine until I do not research first how it works, why it works. Doctor says, no problem, go for 12 years to medical school and figure it out. There's only one issue, they may die before. You have to be in a state where you're healthy enough to be able to research and study biology and study medicine. It's a good thing to figure out how this prescription will help you. But don't wait until you're complete, don't wait until you figure it out completely to take the medicine. You know why? Because you want to be able to be healthy enough that there will be somebody who can research the value of the medicine. Let's understand this. A Jew may have questions on Judaism. Should he say, I'm stopping everything. When I figure it out, then I'm going to start. That's not a wise approach. You know why? To figure out truth, you have to be healthy. 
To figure out truth, you have to have a lucid mind. To figure out truth, you have to have a healthy soul. To figure out truth, you have to be in a state of peace and serenity, not anxious and not full of hate and not full of anger. Torah and mitzvahs are part of the diet for a Jewish soul. If I'm not eating and I'm not drinking and I'm not taking the vitamins my body desperately needs, and I say, when I figure out why I should eat and why I should drink and how that benefits my body and why I should take the vitamins, then I'm going to start. The problem is I'm going to starve to death or I'll become so emaciated I won't have energy to think and to figure out how food helps me or how medicine helps me, how vitamins help me. Eat and drink and do your research and then you'll see. Torah and mitzvahs are part of the diet of a Jewish soul. As we will explore in future classes. Class number four. To put that on hold and say, I'm not going to touch it, I'm not going to do it. When I figure everything out, then I'm going to start. Why starve your soul? It's great to ask, and it's great to understand. And you should pursue understanding, and your mind should remain open. Truth is not afraid of questions. Truth is not afraid of questions. But don't become emaciated in the process. Yeah? It's a great question. It's a good question. This young man is asking, <laughs> very good question. You're asking if a 17-year-old tells his father and mother, I don't know what's true. Maybe you brainwashed me. Maybe you didn't. Let me let go of Judaism. I'm going to go explore. And... Uh, I'll come back. <laughs> Maybe I'll come back. Maybe I won't come back. Shouldn't the parents encourage it? <laughs> I don't know if you're asking a personal question or a hypothetical question. <laughs> you're assuming the 17-year-old is asking his parents' advice. He's not doing it on his own. Okay, if he's doing it on his own, he's doing it on his own. He's asking his parents' advice. What should be their advice? I'll give you an example. Okay. If I have a child who grew up, and when he was a baby, he had a terrible allergic reaction to peanuts and dairy. So I took him to a doctor, another doctor, a third doctor. Common conviction of all of them was he's allergic to peanuts and dairy. As he grew up, I took him to nutritionists, to professionals who examined his body makeup, his composition, his chemical makeup, his blood type, etc., etc. And they came to a conclusion that dairy and peanuts must be off limits to him for him to be able to be healthy, live functional, have a good blood flow, a great adrenaline, and to be able to feel healthy and to be able to function in an optimal level. When he gets a little older, this pizza, Mitzvah Shab, is an ice cream, and he can't have either because it's dairy. Plus, there's a wonderful cake with pecan pie, great peanuts, uh, a, a peanut a cake with peanuts. And mommy says, oh, I'm so sorry, you can't have this. He says, who says? And they explain to him. He says, I don't know. How do I trust him? You know what? Let me go explore. I want to go explore. I'm going to eat, I'll have an allergic reaction, maybe I'll get sick, I'll figure it out, I have to be convinced. I can't rely on your testimony, I can't rely on a doctor and a nutritionist. They say you could go look at the records. No, I want to feel that it's my decision. If you were his parents, what would you tell him? Would you encourage him to go eat peanuts and dairy or not? Would you encourage him? Go... <laughs> What's the, what do you think is the right thing of open-minded, progressive, rational, loving parents to do? What, do you, what would you do? Ah, you're right. If the parents themselves feel brainwashed, yes. But what if the parents don't feel brainwashed? We saw his allergic reactions. We took him to doctors. They're convinced that this is the right thing, even if they didn't go to medical school. They're not brainwashing their child. They love their child. If the child doesn't listen, he doesn't listen. You get what I'm saying? Jews didn't accept Torah because they were brainwashed. They saw the allergic reaction. They heard this from a father and mother who loved them. Millions of Jews heard this from fathers and mothers who loved them. Not, this was not blind faith. 
Did all of them experience themselves? No. Now a child could say, I don't trust. I don't believe. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to try everything. I'm going to start from scratch. People do that. But don't claim that the parents are abusive and oppressive and stupid and dogmatic just because they're telling the child, I don't think you should experiment with eating peanuts and dairy. I think you should stay off these things. And while you stay off, research, research, learn about peanuts, learn about dairy, learn about milk, learn about cheese, learn about your body. Learn about it. Look what you'll come up with. I think that's a much more uh, sensitive and sensible approach, no? This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.